Hi everyone, before the interview I wanted to make a quick introduction to this video. When I wrote to Robert with a question if he would agree to have this conversation, he instantly agreed. During this almost hour of questions and answers, you will experience amazing view of how people can think about tabletop RPGs. I really enjoyed it and hope you will enjoy it as well. In the description of this video, I will leave a link to Robert's drive through RPG page where you can get his awesome game Shadow of the Demon Lord. Now I will speak in Polish for a minute to introduce the Polish viewers. Cześć wszystkim. Rozmowa z Robertem to w jakimś stopniu spełnienie RPGowego marzenia. Zabawne jest to, że nie wiedziałem o jego istnieniu do momentu zakupu Shadow of the Demon Lord, jednak jak później się okazało, uwielbiałem podręczniki, które wyprodukował, choćby w ramach czwartej edycji D&D. Gdy retrospektywnie zacząłem sprawdzać swoje zbiory, jego nazwisko pojawiało się przy bardzo dużej liczbie moich RPGowych faworytów. Mam nadzieję, że ta rozmowa przypadnie Wam do gustu, bo ja bawiłem się fantastycznie. Okay, so uh, so the recording is started. I think uh, I think we can go. Uh, so maybe uh, that's maybe lame, but if 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 it's okay with you, maybe we can start with you introducing yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Robert J. Schwalb. Uh, I'm a game designer uh, and game developer for tabletop role playing games. I've worked on uh, three. I've worked on supplements for three editions of Dungeons and Dragons, including. Uh, being a member of the design team for fifth edition, uh, designing a huge chunk of stuff for fourth, and then uh, being very active with third edition Dungeons and Dragons. I was the line developer for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay second edition. I designed the Song of Ice and Fire roleplaying, which was based on the works by George R. R. Martin. Um, I did the Thieves' World adaptation and the Black Company campaign setting. I've probably written 200 or plus or more articles, source books, and so on. But my big crowning achievement is Shadow of the Demon Lord, which comes out under my own imprint. Uh, and it's a horror fantasy role-playing game that has scads and scads and scads of things for it. Uh, and with that, we also have Punk Apocalyptic, which is a Gonzo-style uh, post-apocalyptic game. And I'm working on Shadow of the Weird Wizard, which is my new fantasy game that's in the works right now. So that's my, my my resume in a snapshot. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe a warm up warm up question because uh, you have worked on a very different products, but also on a on a very big ones. And what has changed from your perspective as a as a game designer, as an RPG designer, like twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, and w where we are now? Like from your perspective, what are what is like how how different is RPG back then and now? What would right. you? Um, I think when uh, when I started, in probably before I even started doing this professionally, uh, I was a I can I consumed role playing games uh, like they were a drug. But I also was very much uh, of the I subscribed to the idea that these are religions of the book, and so there is a right way to play and games should emulate reality and they should be crunchy and complex and difficult to master uh, because you have to ensure that reflects your investment in, in, in the, in the, in the work. Um, I think when I started games tended to be crunchier uh, in the sense that they were, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny now uh, looking back that second edition D and D was not a really complicated game but it had a lot of different subsystems and third edition seems like a really crunchy game, but it's charmingly vague in certain areas. Um, but you can see how the mechanical aspects of game design have kind of uh, shifted towards uh, more systematic uh, approaches to the game design and development and more focus on balance and streamlining uh, that kind of carried us through to fourth edition D and D, which would have been the middle part of my career. And then there's been this big resurgence of the uh, old school, the OSR. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that in part with just the new surge of the new audience that's coming into role-playing games, there's not a lot of room or a lot of patience for big complex game engines anymore. And so I think that most people are shifting more towards a rules light, story heavy 
approach to game design and game play. Okay. So I think, uh, but I think that's also a cycle thing too. So I, I would say that like Shadow of the Demon Lord, maybe let's let's jump to it. Like it's in the middle, I would say, because at the start le the starting levels, especially for, from your game uh, in Shadow of the Demon Lord, are very very easy, like very easy to master. Like I, I love level zero. Like when I when I saw the game, I, I really loved it, and, and and it reminds me of an OSR game, really, like right. very very similar. But you also have this big amount of choices that you that you can make and that you can play with. So so was it something that you wanted to achieve that it would be somewhere in the middle? Because when I was first introduced to Shadow of the Demon Lord, when I was told about it. Someone told me that, yeah, it's a mixture of Warhammer Fantasy and D and D Fourth Edition, and occasionally you, your character can lose its penis. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, 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 and I have to say that this mixture kind of got me into it. And and was it was it a goal that it it will be somewhere in the middle of it? It certainly was. Uh, one of the things I was reacting to during the initial uh, design and what became a major design goal for the development of the game was a reaction to the front-loading choices and complexity to create a barrier to entry. Uh, you, if in, in the, I have vivid memories of the days of third edition when, you, when it started, you had to make a few choices and it was pretty easy, but by the end of that game's lifetime, life cycle, uh, and then you'd be picked up again with Pathfinder, uh, you would just the sheer number of options that, that freighted the game made it almost impossible for a newcomer to just easily jump in and go. I also felt that it's the game's job to teach you how it plays while you're playing it. And so the opportunities to learn, I think, uh, and making that part of the character creation and development process, uh, Kind of lowers the 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 complexity ramp, so that when, as you said, like level zero characters are super simple to play. They just yes. like one, one choice in a couple of tables, and you're playing the game. And that is, an, and the reason for doing it that way is to give the players mastery, the opportunity to master the basic system before having to deal with the exceptions to that system. Uh, and then you see with novice paths brings you into a layer of complexity that's greater than you had before, but it's still relatively simple. But then by the time you get to master paths, there are so many things going on that you've got you've got a lot of toys to play with, but you have eased yourself into it. It's kind of like the the cliche about the frog in boiling in, in water. You don't just drop a frog in boiling water. You put a frog in lukewarm water and gradually raise the temperature so the frog doesn't jump out. Uh, this is the kind of thing where, like, you you played the game through the first nine, ten sessions, and then you realize that you're the end of it, and now you got all these cool things to do, but you know what you're playing with because you've used everything before. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, and uh, I totally agree that that the game the Shadow of the Demon Lord educates its players, like through through the levels, by also limiting choices, but also in the course of the development that you can you can get definitely more 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 choices yeah yeah okay so uh, also a thing that struck me right away when i was starting to reading uh, to read shadow of the demon lord was that at the beginning you are promising that this world world of shadow of the demon lord and the game itself will be a very gray place like there is no ultimate good ultimate evil like their their things are not so so obvious and i have to say that this game delivers it and i see this pattern in the adventures even in character creation in the setting so so what's also this moral ambiguity that you are telling about in the uh, in the forward was it also a very important goal for you to uh, to achieve with shadow of the demon lord very much so. Uh, I am. I have always uh, leaned into uh, dark fantasy as far as my flavor of fantasy. Mm -hmm. And one of the key attributes of dark fantasy, uh, especially in stories and in adventure design, is that any choice you make has consequences. Uh, and usually, those are consequences can be are, are negative in some way. And I wanted to build a game world that that truly reflected uh, that sensibility. I also am, don't, I think it's time 
I think it was time, and I still think it's time, for games to be more reflective of just the real moral ambiguity of life. I mean, we live in a world that is not yeah. just divided into good guys and bad guys, and bad guys think themselves are good guys and vice versa. So it's um, I, I felt that this is more uh, reflective of kind of the current patterns we're seeing in our in our reality. Yeah, and I, I want to, to to kind of to to capture that. Are you satisfied with the end product? Like, is this something that uh, that satisfies you? Like, like how what Shadow of the Demon Lord ended to be? Yeah, I, I'm really happy with uh, the way the game uh, developed. Um, some of the things were happy accidents. Uh, <laughs> as far as, uh, you know, it, it was. I had some big ideas to start with when I was developing when I was developing the core game, but as I was going through the supplements, uh, these ideas would strike me. Like for example, I don't want to give away the spoilers, and although it's been a couple of years, in Exquisite Agony, which kind of reveals the nature of the true of, of the the new god yeah. and how awful that is uh, to the setting, because the new god is kind of represented as this moral pillar, and then have that rug pulled out from under you is is I guess could be it has been upsetting for some people, um, but I think that that goes right to the heart of what I'm trying to do with the game. Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, when I was because I own the book and when I was reading it, it, it was kind of a slap in the face, like, <laughs> <laughs> like wow. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, it worked. Good. So, uh, next question, I will uh, jump between topics. Like, uh, I wanted to ask is why are changelings in the core book? Like, because I see a lot of tropes, fantasy tropes, like in in, in other ancestries. But changelings are not so obvious, and you, you, you in uh, in uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord Companion, you told that uh, you had to cut off some of the material, and you uh, you place there the classic halflings, and changelings are uh, are in the core book. It's not that I don't like it. I, I just wanted to to know the the reason why. why. The the main reason was uh, was because I wanted to subvert expectations about what fairies do in a fantasy world. Uh, I wanted to go to a more primal, more primitive look at and of the source of fairy tales and present fairies as the genuinely frightening figures they ought to be. Uh, I don't see, and I think that in a core game experience you're probably not going to be running around with an immortal in your party, like an elf who's lived for a thousand years. Uh, rather, if you're going to have anything that's going to be representative of the fairy realms, it would be their trash, uh, right? And their trash is represented by the goblins and changelings. Yeah. Fairies steal human children to either make more fairies or to deliver to Diabolus to pay the hell tithe. Uh, and goblins were kicked out of the fairy realms. And so they, and they live among squalor and ruin and, and garbage and, and and so on so th having these as windows into this new take on how fairies fit in the fantasy setting i think was pretty important and moving halflings out of the core book which was a it was hard to do that uh <laughs> because I, I you know i have i do have years and years and years of of D, &D work um and i the original take in the halflings was far more warhammer uh, than they were D&D uh, &D halflings. Um, but <clears throat> I felt that halflings just, I didn't want to make this game another Tolkien thing, right? I didn't want this game to be, I, I wanted you to be very clear to the audience that the stories you're telling are not about going to Mordor and dropping rings in, in, in fiery chasms, or uh, you're not going to be looking for Elminster uh, and doing and, and living vicariously through the exploits of major fantasy characters. This is a grim and gritty world that is on the verge of annihilation, and your characters are most likely going to be deeply flawed. And having characters, art, uh, ancestries that reflect those kind of sensibilities was crucial to uh, the first kind of exposure to this game and to the ethos of uh, the Demon Lord universe. Yeah, I gotta say that it's it's like clear from the very beginning when you are creating your player character, like even the stuff that you can that you can get from the random tables. Like I think my favorite is the dark charcoal piece that radiates menace. Like that's that's <laughs> <just> great. 
So, uh, okay. So also I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, about the ferry. Uh, so I really like how you depict the elves because they are basically aliens. Like they are, they are, they are really scary because they they don't see it as a as something bad to rip off one eye uh, from from humans just because they like it. Like like I think it's in a terrible beauty. So, uh, yep. so uh, where where you got this idea from? Because I see a lot of, for example, because uh, I also own terrible beauty, and I see a lot of inspiration from from Shakespeare for from from, from folklore and and was it a uh, and also like inspiration from folklore because I see a lot of monsters taken from Slavic folklore like Lesha and mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So so was it was it also the the idea in the beginning to utilize like folklore history mythology? Very much so. Uh, and it, a lot of the decisions, a lot of the decisions I made about uh, the fairy peoples, um, I in every in every case I would do a deep dive into the etymological roots of the names and then figure out where they fit in uh into certain tales and then try to uh pay uh, you know pay some respect to the source material and try to preserve their original identity and i think a lot of the and this is just me just mouthing off but i think a lot of these ideas of fairies and spirits and things that live outside kind of are just the, the uh, reactions to living in a scary world where you know it's it, you don't know what's out in the forest and you don't know what's in the in the village next door or you can't explain why certain things are happening around you and to uh, to turn to to animate these uh, these fears and make them boogeymen or uh, it's important to just kind of understanding human psychology. Um, I think going back and then using and of course, Folklore is filled with all sorts of great and scary things, like the Nissa, the little guy who rides the pig, yeah. and then he gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and he's ba he's kind of like he anticipates Santa Claus sort of because he delivers presents, but yeah. then he's also really scary because he's you know it's this little guy with a long beard that drags on the ground that if you make him mad he turns into a giant and smashes your village flat, um, uh, and you know like the Bee and Nye, the washerwoman uh, that shows up in Terrible Beauty who lashes you with uh, her wet clothes and then forces you to suckle on her. her yes, that's you know, that's like pure poetry for me. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. It's gross and weird, but it comes, I mean, it comes directly out of, of uh, mythology and folklore. So it it was a really, it's a veritable mind for me to just keep digging stuff out. I could do, I could just play in that, in that sandbox the rest of my life and be very happy. I love uh, looking at, the monstrousness of, of fairies. Now, about going back to the elves, one of the ways I, I, one of the mindsets I had to adopt in in writing about them was to think about how humans interact with other organisms on this planet, and then make and then shift that by a step. So then we have ur humans or elves or immortals mm -hmm. who are then regarding humans as just other kinds of animals. So, you know, you, I, you know, one person might look at a, at a, at a cute otter swimming in a, in a, in a, in a river and another person might say that'd make a really nice hat. And so, uh, I felt like those sensibilities could also apply to fairies interacting with humans because they're just, they're just animals that just have the ability to talk. Um, and much like parrots or whatever else. So it would be nothing for an elf to, keep a, an attractive human with a nice singing voice in a cage in their court. And then until they starve to death or they're neglected or they forget to feed this human and then, you know, whatever terrible things happen. And I love that idea, right? Because it inverts our own, it, it, it sabotages our own sense of superiority in the pecking order of species and kind of reveals the inherent cruelty of our own interactions with, uh, with other organisms. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's. I I when I was start firstly like uh, learning the the elves of, of Shadow of the Demon Lord, it's it's scary that these are the things that if they would kill you, like they they wouldn't even blink because like this is not, you are not someone that they should be taking care of. Like, like that's that's because and that's what what I liked because uh, it's really 
it's not your classic fantasy uh, elves like like Tolkien elves or something like that. Yeah. So so uh, uh, and also on that note, uh, because uh, you take this folklore, these this mythologies, and and you utilize them, and do you think that? people right now are trying to be, uh, or, or would you agree with it, that people right now, the creators are trying to be like, uh, they want to create something new, like really like uh, hyper original things some, sometimes. And, and, and they, don't, they don't want to look back at what our cultures ha have produced because like you said, stuff like uh, stuff like you have in terrible beauty. Also, red caps, I think, are, are from from the folklore. Like uh, stuff like uh, Manangal or Penangal, and there are some some monsters like that. They are really crazy. And and are people trying? Maybe do you think like they should try to look back at what our history has produced already? Because there are some crazy stuff there already. I think so. Uh, I think there there is virtue in trying to carve out new ground, right? But I also think that makes that task all the harder because uh, the monstrous archetypes, like the, the uh, that, like for example, the werewolf, it reflects the beast within, uh, We and then Frankenstein's monster, uh, we have the created, and man trying to, the man's hubris of trying to become God, and we, you, know, you and then the perils of science with the invisible man, and all the kind of the classic monstrous archetypes uh, are there for a reason, and they inform us, and they're part of our lexicon uh, when we're communicating ideas. If I if I say that person's like a vampire, that's shorthand to tell me everything I need to know about yeah. that person uh, and how they're they're they're, uh, they're just yeah. Um, when you are trying to stake out new territory, um, it becomes difficult for the designer or author to be able to communicate the same ideas without the shorthand. I think it's bolder, like a China Mayville, for example, I think is fantastic at introducing new monstrous concepts that are thoroughly alien and thoroughly innovative, but uh, still resonate. But I also see a lot of times where, you know, you might just get a bizarro name that's attached to some sort of monster without any real context, and it falls flat because I'm not really sure what this thing does or why it, why, why, why it would even exist or how it could exist or how it reflects ourselves. Because I think all the mo monsters are reflections of our own ideas and our fears and misgivings and our, uh, yeah, disappointments and all those things kind of bound up together. So I, I, I think there is value to looking at folklore and mythology and teasing out um, elements from them to inform our current design. But I also think that it is, uh, I, I kind of would aim for a middle path where trying to reinvent those elements or repurpose those ideas mm -hmm. in forms could be also interesting. Uh, okay, and then next question. Who are the, the player characters in the, in the Shadow of the Demon Lord game? Because I would not agree that they are the heroes. So They're not heroes. Uh, the 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 thought was if you know you look at every zombie apocalypse story uh and you just get a random draw of people you're gonna have psychopaths you're gonna have cowards you're gonna have courageous people you're gonna have strange deranged sick weird twisted folks they're all gonna be coming together because they have a common enemy and demon lore and one of the the great problems that a lot of role-playing games that are more light versus dark is a temptation to introduce darker elements on the as player facing tools so that i want to play an anti-paladin D, D. well that's going to be a problem because D D's, you know the story that's on the tin is that you're going into dungeons and killing monsters and taking their stuff and the monsters deserve to die because they're inherently evil that's mm -hmm. that's the story so if I play something that's inherently evil, then that means I am that it it under it, it causes one to question, and if you think any deeply at all about the the arrangement, the the morality of going into places that are infested with evil monsters, and you're when you yourself are evil, you would do that. But then it calls into question your companions, and then you have town conflict and all that other stuff. With this, uh, demons are not something you can play in Demon Lord. And the reason why is because demons are outgrowths of the 
the demon lord itself, and their goal is to unravel reality and restore it to uh, the divinity, which has been uh, reduced by creation into its present raving form. Uh, so, if your world is threatened, uh, you might be a you might be a mass murderer. But uh, you can't mass murder people if demons have destroyed your planet. So it's going to behoove you to work with others in order to achieve your common goal. And so I wanted to make I wanted to offer players a more realistic uh, spread of options as far as the kinds of people that might step up to to do this. I mean, I might be a crazy. I might be. A, I might be a, 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 an axe murderer. But you know what? Being an axe murderer is probably pretty good at taking out demons. <laughs> and other monstrous things that are that are threatening to unravel reality, you kind of want him on your side. Uh, and so having that as a player character choice seemed to be logical and also fun because it's allowing people to experience a somewhat familiar fantasy world, although it will surprise you, um, but do it in a way where your persona is not the shining knight or the the brilliant wizard or whatever the other typical archetypes are. Uh, okay. So, uh, yes. So I, I have to say that, uh, it also like struck me when I, when I was reading the, like th that you can be, you can be a murderer, like you can be, uh, you can be a, ro a robber or someone like that. It's, it depends on who, uh, what you will, what you will get from the table. But yeah, yeah, th that definitely adds on the, on this on this gray uh, gray color to the world so so yeah yeah i can agree with it so uh, and uh, i also can tell that they the characters are definitely not heroes and they are just trying to do something and we'll see how it ends uh, at least that's how we how i usually run the game so uh, next question of mine will be um, i often see accusation for Shadow of the Demon Lord Adventures that they have a really tough monster inside like that 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 the that the opponent is way above uh, way above uh, party's level and and reach and i have my opinion about it but i wanted to ask what's the was the design uh, the design idea behind of it? Uh, for example, like in adventure, uh, if I recall correctly, necessary sacrifices. You have this ve uh, very very strong entity uh, there that that the player that the players can face. So, so what is the idea behind putting such strong opponents inside adventures? The key thing to remember with Shadow of the Demon Lord is that I have described it as a fantasy game, a dark fantasy game, but it is also a horror game. And so being a horror game means that there is no expectation that you're going to win. There's never a chance. There's, there's, there's no guarantee that one or all of you are going to survive by the end. And in fact, I would even su suggest that some of the best Shadow of the Demon Lord adventures are where you throw yourself and everything you've got at the big scary guy and then die. Because when you watch a horror movie... They people who have you know gone into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house aren't coming out feeling pretty good about themselves and backslapping each other. They're all dead, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, uh, and so there's having super scary monsters uh, that are probably a notch or two or even three above what the player characters can handle forces the players to rethink their strategy and tactics for dealing with the, th the threat. And that may mean that, you know, we're not just going to, we're just not going to fight this thing. We're going to find some other way to deal with it. So you want to save the village where that big scary monster is coming out of the water. Well, maybe you should sacrifice some children to the thing. And then you give your little village a reprieve for another generation before the monster comes back. Or uh, there was another adventure with, um, oh, it was uh, the one in, uh, my father left forever. Uh, which has the the nymph who just automatically charms anyone who looks at her, pretty much. And that's and the one in terrible beauty, I guess. Yeah. Yes, yeah. there's almost no way to beat her. I've run it multiple times, <laughs> and so that creates some really cool scenes. Though it's like, well, you know, after you've already been charmed by her once, or you you've managed to get away, that if you see her, but you need you know you've got to take her out. What are you going to do? Well, I could see a player character player saying, 
I'm going to carve my character. My character is going to carve his own eyes out and then go at this thing blind. And that changes. That's a, that's a really cool and awful and upsetting experience, but it is a horror game. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of it, it. I do think, though, that uh, because I've always said that Demon Lord, the horror is on a dial and you and I would normally run when I run it, I run it at 11. Uh, you certainly could you know, soften it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know a lot of game masters do. I don't, but my first, <laughs> my first game session ended up with, uh, with a few, few, uh, few player characters dead, but, but we had fun, we had fun definitely. So, uh, also like monsters don't have their challenge ratings uh, in, in like in the real world if you go to encounter a monster they are not like having a challenge rating at, on the top of their heads so and that's right. that's that's not how it works in horror movies so uh, so on the other hand why did you make combat so fun in shadow of the demon lord because it is hell of fun it is a lot of fun yeah. uh combat is uh it's just it's just fun. I, I hate. I mean, I know that uh, I, the Shadow of the Game, Demon Lord is a game that doesn't let you explore other circumstances and uh, and the repercussions of your decisions and your actions. But it is a fighting game, right? I mean, it's a game where you're gonna you're gonna get into nasty brawls and you're gonna see cool spells go off and you might lose your penis yes. and you <laughs> might you with your buddies. Uh, I think that's all. That's all just kind of part and parcel of that fantasy aspect, right? Uh, and uh, I think it's the the union of, because I didn't want to just make Call of Cthulhu again, right? Mm -hmm. But put it in Dark Ages where you're not actually, you know, I imagine every time I play Call of Cthulhu, getting into a combat is the last thing you ever want to do in that game, right? Mm -hmm. um, this game under, uh, does something a little different where it says, no, you want to get into a combat because it's fun, and then you realize that combat's not always the answer by the time you you get to the big bad boss or or the final scene, and that's where uh, that's where the the game is actually betraying you at the end. So was uh, that's also that's also something I wanted to ask. So was some somehow like fourth edition D and D uh, kind of uh, did it had influence uh, on on Shadow of the Demon Lord because. And there are some similarities uh, between how how the how the abilities powers are being picked or something like that. So, yeah, uh, that is true. Um, what, I, I can't deny that fourth edition informed some of the decisions I made. Um, I think that, unfortunately, fourth edition probably came out maybe ten years too early. I think had it come out uh, around now, I think it would have been much better received uh, as a game. Um, there's I, really I have an opinion that the biggest sin of fourth edition D&D is that its name was Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, so I, if, if it would come out like 13th age came out and it was a really popular game but yeah. Yeah. Um yeah so there there I think there's really good design in fourth edition uh and there and some and I, I liked the structured approach a lot of the thoughts that go into monster design and kind of the Design, design philosophies that uh, fourth edition embraced for building monsters to kind of focus them in on doing one or two really interesting things and not just loading them up with a laundry list of various abilities to make sure that the monster uh, when and I don't front I don't I don't customer face this but monsters usually have some sort of kind of role or play idea like they may be a more of a brute or a skirmish. Mm -hmm. Or something like that, and that kind of that all plugs in on like the initial design building, but I don't reveal those. They, the mechanics themselves, kind of reveal the 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 nature of which they, the the way they play it on, on the table. So yeah, fourth edition was an influence. Uh, fifth edition was an influence, but I uh, that should be no surprise, largely because I worked on fifth edition right before it. Um, and Warhammer Fantasy was a pretty big, uh, had a lot of had a lot of play in that as well. So also uh, I think about monsters. So uh, they really have cool abilities. Like they are really uh, fun to use, and that's also something that that I wanted to highlight. That that the monsters when when I was using them as a, as a as a game master. So 
they they don't are the, like your skin like the, the, because in some games like you have a limited amount of abilities spread among all of the monsters and this is basically like a skin for another monster and all they have is multi attack and access to to spell casting so so but in shadow of the demon lord like a lot of monsters are very different they have unique abilities and and that's really this really makes combat fun and also unpredictable right I agree, and that's that was that was certainly one of the the, the objectives. Um, and I've carried that same idea forward for to uh, the next game, Weird Wizard. That I, I, I my, making monsters is my favorite thing to do, uh, and I, I enjoy the work, and I have the most fun doing it. So, um, yeah, making monsters really pop on, in in game in, in play because there's something more there's something more boring than having like a guy that's got a plus five bonus to hit and it does one D eight plus two damage. And that's all he does. <laughs> it's like, uh, why even, why even have it? Why even waste the space? Right. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but if you had like that, that, that kind of mechanic that sits inside of there that just kind of tells you something, but if the guy, you know, teleports or when he's injured, he turns himself inside out or he divides or he gets a gelatinous sheen over his body or, uh, mouths open up on the ground around him. Those kind of things make it really exciting. And uh, also, uh, next. Uh, sorry, that, that jumping to next question. I was uh, I was thinking in Polish. Sorry, almost sorry. almost ask you a, almost ask you a question in Polish. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, why no magic items? Like I really like this idea that the magic items are really. Uh, they are really they have little abilities like showing you where north is or something like that and you you can have a mundane mundane item that, that is enchanted and the relics are always they always have this backlash like um, almost always they have the backlash that they are not the good items to use so uh, so wh where this decision came from that that to strip out the the magic items uh magic items are always a especially in, in Pathfinder D and D other fantasy games, the magic items for me have always been problematic in the sense that they offer a significant power up. Uh, and when you're okay, so here's the, here's the issue. If, if we're playing first edition or second edition AD and D and you get a magic item, that's your cool power. That's a cool thing your character gets to do because without that magic item, what is your fighter doing? Your fighter swinging a sword, yes. or maybe maybe shooting a, cro a bolt from a crossbow, but doesn't have any other. It has, has no no levers, no dials, nothing to play with. He's just and doing. They, that's what that's what the character does. And every fighter is the same, basically. Same, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, and the differences between ability scores are not significant enough in order to uh, make yourself feel different. And the the differences between weapons aren't broad enough because people are going to gravitate to the most effective weapons normally anyway. So. Giving a fighter a rod of lordly might is a big deal for that player because that's where that player feels distinct and cool and fun. And getting magic armor to go with that and then getting a bunch of other things to kind of help that character become more distinct, that's the role magic items play in D&D. The problem uh, in D that I think that D&D has run into is that in order to solve the problem of character individual individuating characters, uh, these role the, the, the various versions of the game have given players more options within other areas like uh, feats, prestige classes, um, skills, all those other things. Right? Yeah. Um, those things, those elements, are what make those characters distinct. That distinction was what magic items did. And so now magic items fall into this gray nebulous place where we're not really sure what they're supposed to do. Uh, and you can tell like in fourth edition, in fourth edition, there was a big struggle with how do we, why do we even have magic items when characters already have all these cool things they can do. And then in fifth edition, rather than, I mean, we did, we went back to an older mindset, but characters still have a lot of moving parts. And now you have attunement and other things to kind of limit all. It's just a big mess with, the, the objective in Demon Lord is not to go and collect treasure. That's not what we're, that's not why you're playing the game. Uh, and 
that is a, the objective for Pathfinder D and D is to go to monsters into dungeons, kill monsters, take their stuff. That's not what we're doing in Demon Lord, and because that's not the focus in Demon Lord, there's no. I don't feel the need. I didn't feel the need to put shiny carrots in front of the player characters to get power ups, and then also uh, if they do find something that is magical where you have persistent permanent magic that it should have some sort of malfunction because that malfunction is what allows it to be permanent um because the the story we're telling with magic by the by dint of spells that spells are short-term effects that create changes in reality for an instant or for a few instants for a few minutes or whatever uh they don't last forever so when you cast a spell, you're not making a permanent change, you're making a brief change. So it would have to be something significant to be able to imbue an object with magic that lasts over an extended period of time. And I think the corruption uh, that comes from these relics makes them interesting. It makes them, like, I want this crazy sort of undoing, but it's going to undo me in the process. Yeah. So it's kind of like with a casino or something like that. So because yeah. when when I was running I, and my players had a relic, uh, so they, they they were always thinking like, if we want to use it now, or or, or do we have to? Like, do we have to? Was 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 the the, 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 the <laughs> most mostly asked question. So so you also talked about the carrots and and that you are not putting it in the game. And uh, is it also why there is no experience points in the game? Uh, right. I, I don't think, um, well, so this kind of, this, the, the lack of experience points and the leveling process, there are a couple reasons why the game takes its final form. Uh, and to start with, um, I realized that it's very difficult to run the two, three, five year play experience as I'm getting older. Uh, yes. the most, I, the most time I can commit to a campaign is probably a couple of months. And I don't really, and, a, and after that, I'm, I want to do something else because time is precious. So um, Demon Lord was, I figured that if I could get people to play for 11 sessions and get a full campaign out of it, that's awesome. And so that, and because I wanted people to play every time to keep them coming, the carrot is the fact that every time you finish an adventure, your character gets something new at the end of it uh, by, by the group increasing its level by one. We don't need it, it eliminates the need for any other kind of bookkeeping. Um, as far as experience points in like D and my, my uh, I have gone rounds and round with uh, people, with especially with my friend Stephen Radden McFarland, uh, about experience points because I feel that, and I think we're both. I think everybody feels like XP is just it's just old design doesn't really work anymore. We don't need it. It's just needless bookkeeping. Um, but I do, but I, I, I think people need to remember that experience points served a very, very peculiar role when they, when it applied in the first uh, incarnations of Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, you got to remember that characters didn't advance at the same rate. Uh, so that your experience points total would allow characters that would, to level up at different points. And what's interesting about that is that it spread it's spread around character increases and moments uh, for shining, right? So the thief in first edition uh, got second level at 12, 1,250 experience points and the fighter got at 2000 experience points. So you might get that 1250 after your second adventure. And so the thief is now level two thief player feels pretty awesome. I've got all my stuff's gotten better. I feel cool about this. I feel good about my choice. The next session, the fighter gets to get to level two, and that player gets to feel really good. And it means that your characters are advancing at slightly different rates, and it lets the mechanics of the classes do different things and pop their abilities at different points. And I think, in that sense, XP makes sense. But if everybody's expected to advance the same rate, there's no point. Yeah, so, so I, I have, like, a few months ago, I have finished a 18 months campaign in Shadow of the Demon Lord, and oh. we ended up at level 7, I think, and we were basically, like, deciding when do we want to go with the level. So so that's how we did it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, right, recently you have, you have started a new... Uh, I think it's a new installment because I have two products... Uh, uh, unspeakable things uh, in Shadow of the Demon Lord. Like I really like the the last one, especially with this uh, with this uh, 
with this art, with this eye behind the behind the heel, it's it's a great one. So, uh, what's the idea behind this one? Like, uh, or or what what can people expect? Because this this inspires really to to create an adventure around around this one this one monster. Yeah, uh, this was uh, well. Uh, what happened with Inspeakable Things uh, was that twenty twenty happened, right? Uh, yeah. And- Last year was really hard on me, and I know it was hard on a lot of people, and uh, my release schedule kind of uh, took a hit uh, as I was grappling with just the new reality of what it means to be on this planet right now. And so uh, as I was gearing up to start this year's work, um, I needed something to light a fire under my my ass. And so what I did was I reached out to the, my, the artists I work with and said, hey, I'll pay you a bit more. But just make up a monster, and I'm going to write words around it. And the what I and what I've been getting has been incredible because you take you take the leash off the artist and you let them really exercise their talents and let them kind of look at thing look for things that scare them or inspires them or turns them on. You get I'm getting really great stuff, and of course their enthusiasm has inspired me to uh, to kind of rise above and and meet. The awesomeness that's in the, the in the piece, um, because these are special creatures in almost every case. I'm trying to one. I don't. I don't want to just throw out a monster that you know. As we were saying, plus five bonus to hit, gives <laughs> one to hit plus two damage. I want the monster to to fit in the world, to have a reason for existing, and to have its presence be big enough that it becomes a considerable threat. So like the, the first one we did with uh, the art by Mirko Paganesi is this thing that just feeds on fear and so it can change its form to, a, to look in whatever way. And so that's why the art is so, uh, it's, got all, it's got everything in it, right? It's got crucified people, it's got a naked person, it's got goblin eyes inside of the chest, and it's got a crown, it's got all sorts of stuff. And so I felt like, all right, so now I can see this thing being an affection that might take over part of the world. Uh, this, then we had, um, Let's see. We had the the one that ripped off people's genitals, which was this egg laying creature that lived underground, and the whole story that kind of wraps around that. I mean, it does kind of suggest to the reader that this is a re- there's a really cool adventure if you just unpack it, right? And that, and that, so I think that the next one we have coming up is a piece by Jack Kaiser, uh, and if anybody who's been following Demon Lord knows that Jack's uh, he's a regular contributor to this stuff. And we have a, a bizarre spider creature that lives inside of human bodies. And so uh, the piece shows this guy with a spider that's kind of embedded in his body, crawling out from the darkness. And so um, I have a I have a thing for this. It's going to be really good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what's your favorite Shadow of the Demon Lord cover? Oh, uh, I. F- it's probably Exquisite Agony. Uh, I love that cover. Uh, so much because uh man it, it just something about the fact there's a big demon on the, a big devil on the front with his junk hanging out and he's spoken people i love that um i'm also really partial to the core book cover uh it 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 really sets the tone it tells it transmits to the reader that the game the threats are bigger than the player characters you know, the big scary monster the hammer on the front the horned ogre and the characters are small, and so there it means that it, it just it communicates this idea that things are bigger and more dangerous and nastier than you're used to. <clears throat> and then also the background showing all the different nooks and crannies you can go and explore suggests that this is, it's a game that invites you into into this dark world. Yeah, mine is terrible beauty, and that's because I think it's it's really appropriate to the. To the title of the book so oh yeah jack did a great job on that one yeah yeah so uh i i would wrap it up for for Shadow of the demon lord and because like uh we talked before before we started recording that i wanted to ask you one question about about dnd uh so we kind of touched this topic but i wanted to ask you because i'm a big fan and i was i was there be during the whole the release cycle of the fourth edition and I am I am a big fan of this game. Uh, I am also a fan of the OSR games, and and Shadow of the Demon Lord is is my sweet spot between D and D and the OSR. So, 
where did it go wrong for fourth edition? Like because it got a lot of <laughs> bad reviews and and like 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 I said, I think that its its biggest sin was the, that it the name uh, that it was Dungeons and Dragons. I think so too. Um, <clears throat> there were there were a number of factors in that game that caused some problems. I'm gonna get some water. I'll be right back. Sure. Oh, sorry about that. No problem. All right. Um, let's see. So I think there were two issues with fourth edition. One was that uh, it changed the way the game played. It changed the, the everything about the game that, that people knew had changed as far as the delivery, uh, the presentation, the balance between wizards and fighters. Um, but then with that, also came a vast change to the cosmology of the game. Gone was a great wheel. The Forgotten Realms were advanced by 100 years. Uh, you know, you things that people believed were, was true about D&D, things that were the language that people used to even talk about D&D had changed uh, in order to keep up with, with the game. And so what happened, and I, that's a wax too philosophical, I think that because a lexicon changed and how people uh, communicate their ideas about what their expectations are and what things exist in that world, uh, it created some dissonance in the audience. Uh, I think there were uh, there was a problem during playtesting where uh, people felt the combats were way too fast, and so that we increased the hit points for monsters, and so that meant that combats went from being way too fast to way too slow. Um, and then I also think there was the aggressiveness of the release schedule, uh, having monthly content in Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine combined with regular hardback releases and combined with a dependency on uh, the, uh, the D&D uh, tools online made it so that it made it harder for new people to come into the game. That all said... Uh, I think it is a brilliant game. Uh, you owe, you're never at a loss for what to do in your turn. Combat can be really fun, and we had and the you know, people who worked on uh, Fourth Edition are among some of the brightest and best game designers out there. It's just it just happened to land at a time that was wrong for the hobby. I and, also think that Fourth Edition produced the the best inspiration books uh, like for, from i i I, pl I started playing third edition fourth edition then briefly five or fifth edition and i think it released out some of the greatest inspiration books like like setting books like world uh, world description as, and, and i don't know Dem demonomicon uh, this stuff like that and i think yeah so. it was i would love to go back and and do that again. if i could go back and do that again if i could I mean, I know 13th Age exists and does scratch that itch uh, because it plays very similar. It plays a very similar style. But uh, I don't know. As the, there is something to be said for a really cool fighting game where you've got miniatures and you're moving stuff around and you've got really cool elaborate set dressing. It's just a lot of fun. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a struggle. And it was one of those games where I started because I, uh, I had just left Green Renin Publishing uh, to work for, as a contractor for Wizards of the Coast, and I was full time with Wizards uh, for then uh, until I guess it was 2014. Um, and coming into that game cold because I had no idea what to expect, it was a shock, and it took me a while to to even to, to even, for even me to warm up to it. Um, but then once I was in it, I was I was fully in it. So, what's your favorite D and D D and D fourth edition book that you have worked on? Um, I could cheat and say uh, 
player's handbook three, uh, but that's probably not true. I really like, I like working on the player's handbooks. I worked on the second one and the third, and then I worked on the monster manual two. And did we do three of those? Um, I, yeah, I liked all those. Dark Sun probably though was, was the, the high water mark for me. I had a lot of fun working on that. Uh, I would say that yours, my favorite, is is third monster manual. Uh, I I got it recently from Amazon. I was able to buy it, so so it really has. I I, I see the similarities between Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, that's what that's what I can tell. That the, the description of monsters are much more darker. <laughs> so yeah, we had that. That, that, that was the one with uh, Law from the cover, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That was a lot of fun. I. I that was a whole lot of fun to work on because we got to go into some interesting places for sure. Okay. So, uh, so then, uh, then I think we can wrap it up here. Thank you okay. for, thank you for having this conversation. It's really an honor that, that you, that we could talk here. So I'm, I'm really always happy to, always happy to talk. It was really, really great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. 